so the <clears throat> the plan for this workshop is um yeah to have a session like this every monday for the next uh, three weeks um during this live session um we will go through some of the um, assignments together um and then afterwards um, you could work on on the other assignments um, yourself you can find all the information on the github page i created uh, let me show you where is it yeah so this is the the github page um <clears throat> here you found the link to to the session um we have also set up a server which you can use for the assignments if you don't have a ti publisher installed on your own machine which is certainly preferable um and uh, there will be assignments below this link yeah so you can see um, a series of assignments, and we will throw, walk, probably walk through the first one for each topic uh, during this session. And then um, afterwards during the week, um, yeah, please at least redo uh, what we did during this session, and then maybe have a look at other assignments. Um, in general, it's, it's important. Um, yeah, that you get some hands on on practice with with TI Publisher. Um, TI Publisher is actually not that difficult to learn, but uh, you need to fam familiarize yourself with the concepts um, <clears throat> and get get used to the kind of thinking um, which, uh, in particular, the processing model requires. Okay, so let's start with the presentation So let's first have a look at what TI Publisher actually is. So a rough overview over the different um, parts and components. Um, yeah, what is TI Publisher? Um, so it is intended to be uh, a toolbox, um, which is largely based on, on standards, so as much as possible based on standards. And uh, it's primarily designed uh, for reusability and sustainability. Um, so before starting work on TI Publisher, I have done um, many uh, digital edition projects during the past uh, 20 years or so. And as a developer, um, I frequently got um, upset and annoyed with um, yeah, having to repeat my own code over and over again so ti publisher is intended as as an answer uh to that um essentially what it does it it's like a, a little um box of say lego blocks um which you can assemble yourself uh to in the end, create your own digital edition. So you have little blocks which you can recombine and move around and uh, each of them does a certain job. That's the basic idea behind it. Um, so if you install TI Publisher, uh, what you actually see at first is the TI Publisher app. The TI Publisher app is mainly intended um, for you to, to learn how to work with TI Publisher, to play around with uh, different ODDs. So we will soon see what the ODD is. 
Um, it also provides various uh, source documents, which differ um, in scope and to mark up. Um, and it also showcases various layouts. So just a text or a text with a facsimile, a text with translation, things like that. So the DI Publisher app itself is more like um, yeah, a shell to, to experiment with uh, the features DI Publisher provides. At some point though, uh, when you think you, exper uh, you were experimenting enough and you feel confident with, with what you did and you feel you master it halfway, um, there will be a point when you want to generate a standalone custom edition out of um, TI Publisher app. So that's that's also what it is. Yeah, it's an app generator. It can generate a boilerplate for you to um, continue working with. Um, but at first, um, you likely want to familiarize yourself with TI Publisher and, and using just the app. Um, so the first step would be to actually um, upload um, the data we will use for the workshop. So I need to switch screen again to quickly show you how TI Publisher looks. Um, Going back to my web browser. So when you installed TI Publisher, it will look like this. Um, there's also the version on the server, which I will use now, which looks like this. So if, if you don't have TI Publisher installed locally, all you have to do is go to apps5test.existsolutions.com. And if you go there, the first thing you will see but likewise on your local install is the so-called Exist dashboard. So Exist organizes um, applications built on top of the database into um, little apps. Yeah, they're a bit like apps on, on, on your phone. Um, so they come as uh, pre-configured packages and contain everything you need to, to run them on an Exist instance. TI Publisher is implemented as such an app. And in the dashboard, uh, you see the collection of currently installed apps. So to start TI Publisher, you just click on, on the icon. And this is how the um, TI Publisher uh, start page looks like. So I think someone, Nadine, just wrote in. Uh, Slack that she can't hear anything, but I think everyone else is fine. Yeah, so I will just continue. If uh, anyone has a problem hearing, then please tell me. Okay, so the start screen of TI Publisher 6 will look like this. Um, as you can see, um, we now provide different collections. So uh, I should maybe switch to English. So. Let's switch to English. Um, we provide various collections, the TI Publisher Demo Collection. That's um, a collection of prepared examples uh, showcasing um, certain use cases, certain applications of Publisher. Um, then, no, go back. Then we have the playground, which at the moment is empty. And we have the documentation, which is uh, the reference for all TI Publisher features. So we can first go to the playground. And then we should upload um, the sample documents we will use during this workshop. Um, the sample documents, they are actually in the um, Git repository. So if you click here, or if you just look at the start page, then there's this data subdirectory. And you can go in there. And then there's um, um, DODIS is what we will use for this first session mainly. Um, and there's SSRQ, which is uh, Swiss law sources. Um, but we will now concentrate on DODIS. 
So this contains the documents and you can download this. So either clone this repository if you are familiar with Git or if not, then you have the possibility on the start page again uh, to just download a zip file of everything and then unpack this onto your local disk. And in the next step, we can actually upload documents. So we go back to our TI publisher playground. Um, <clears throat> to upload something, I need to log in. There are <clears throat> two default users um, defined in TI publisher. One is called TI and the other is called TI demo. Um, we make this distinction. Stop, because... stop, stop, please, please. Uh, for me, it's much too fast. <laughs> okay. I haven't reached uh, the right point uh, where you had the data. Could mm -hmm. you restart from the path to the data, please? Yes, okay. So if you are on the workshop GitHub page, um, you will find the TI documents we will use for, for this session in the data subfolder. Um, if you want to upload them yourself, then you need to download them, which you can either do by um, checking out this repository via Git. But if you are not familiar with Git, then you can download the whole repository um, here by clicking on download zip. So this gives, gives you um, a zip file containing everything in this repository. And what we want to do now is to actually upload those documents. There are five documents from the DODIS collection. So DODIS is um, a Swiss institution. I, I, I'm so sorry. I don't know how the others are managing, but I can't do the things as quickly as you speak. I first have to oh, listen sorry. and then uh, do it. So could you just make little pauses in between so that Okay. We can actually do it. Okay, I forgot to mention that at this point you don't really need to to follow immediately. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So the idea is that during this hour I will do things for you, and you can watch it, and then later on we will upload the video so you can rewatch. But there will also be an explanation in the assignments. So I hope that by, by re-watching the video and by following the assignments, you will be able to repeat it yourself. Yeah, because otherwise one hour will not be sufficient. Yeah, we would need to, to have a whole day or so. Um, but online, this is difficult. Is this okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> so again, uh, you should have those documents on your local disk if you want to install into a local TI Publisher instance. If you do not have TI Publisher installs and you just want to use our server, then you don't need to do anything because I'm now going to upload those documents for us. So I'm going to TI Publisher and I log in as TI demo, password is demo. This is written above here, yeah, so you don't need to note it down. It's written here. I log in and then down there to in the right co bottom corner, there will be this upload panel appearing. And here you can just click on, oh, cool, it gets big. I can click on it and then I select those documents and I say open. And you see they started uploading and are now in this list. So this would be the first step to, to set this up. And I can now click on any of those documents. And what I see is 
the default rendition of this document according uh, to the TI standard renditions. But we will in a minute see how this is done and how we can customize it. Yeah, so those are the preparation steps you would need to do if you have TI Publisher installed locally. If you're using the server, you don't need to do anything. The documents will already be there because I already uploaded them. Okay, let me get back to my presentation. So, yeah, recapitulate what I said. Um, TI Publisher um, is not uh, not just TI Publisher app, but you can also it can also be used to generate standalone editions out of it. So if we look at it at more de in more detail, actually. Um, TI Publisher app and the standalone edition. Um, they share certain things, the key components of TI Publisher. There are two key components. Um, the first key, t key component is the TI Publisher lib or library. That's actually an implementation of the so-called TI processing model. The TI processing model is part of the TI standard and it basically does all the transformation of TI documents to had HTML as we just saw. So this is one of the core components of TI Publisher, what it's based on. The other core components are actually the user interface components. So um, all the uh, components displaying text or buttons to navigate or um, input fields to search. Those are the user interface components and the TI Publisher app, as well as the standalone edition. They basically just pull in those two core components, the, the library and the user interface components. And uh, with this, they, they generate um, the app. So during this first week, we will completely focus on this part. So just TI Publisher Lib and the TI Processing module, model. And in the next week, um, we will then uh, move on towards the second part, the pink part here, which is user interface components. So first week, TI Processing model. We will only concentrate on this and do nothing else for now. Um, yeah, what is the TI processing model? Um, it's a media independent description of transformation rules in TI. So if you have done like XSLT or other ways to transform TI into, into um, HTML or PDF or so, the TI processing model basically is a replacement for this. And I talked about it quite a bit in, in the other talk I gave three weeks ago. So if you want to know more about the, the background and the intentions behind it, then best to um, re-view uh, this, uh, this talk I already gave. I will, I will skip most of the introductory um, stuff here because we want to get hands on. Um, but just to quickly summarize the TI processing model, it's part of the official TI guidelines and has been added to the standard already in 2016. It basically powers all the text transformations you see in TI Publisher. So it's like the absolute core of TI Publisher. And in my experience, it's much more sustainable and usually faster than handwritten transformations. <clears throat> um, 
if you look at the typical page within TI Publisher, so any of the examples. So what I show here, that's um, a letter from uh, Hernan Cortez to uh, Johannes Dantiscus. Um, and as you can see, it has multiple parts being shown. What we have uh, top left is the document title. So this is rendered via TI processing model. It's one, one part being shown here. Another part is the transcription shown to the left. Then we have a facsimile of the letter. And to the right, we have a translation. Um, all those parts, oops, sorry. All those parts, they are transformed via the TI processing model. And what we want to learn is how to do this ourselves. So if, if you have an addition, um, which also comes with different views and different features and aspects to be displayed. Um, then you should know how to use the processing model to transform those different aspects. Um, the TI processing model is tightly connected to a certain part of the TI. Um, this part is called the ODD, yeah, and um, basically it's a it's a vital part because, as you might know, um, TI documents they can be very different. So every project tends to use its own, say, dialect of of TI, which is completely fine because the basic assumption behind TI is that we that it does not want to press projects into a very fixed scheme, um, understanding that in the humanities, this is rarely ever, ever possible. So every project in the humanities tends to be different and very specific and special. Yeah? So you cannot just press a project into one scheme, which should then fit, fit everything. Um, so the TI is very flexible, very dynamic, um, which has the disadvantage that every project tends to do TI slightly different. So like say a person, so a person in appearing in a document can at least be encoded in say three to four um, different ways in TI. Um, it's still standardized, yeah, but uh, there are just different ways to achieve the same, to express the same semantically. Um, the ODD then um, has been uh, designed to, to compensate for this heterogeneity we have in TI. Yeah? Because the ODD, that's the place where a project would document what kind of transcription rules were used, what TI elements were used and exactly how. So I will not cover this in detail um, because it's a, yeah, well, designing a proper TI for a project, I think is an art in itself. Um, so we won't cover this here, but it's important to note that the role of the ODD is to keep things together um, and to make sure that if someone else uh, gets into the project or receives the data, um, this person has a chance to understand how things were encoded in this particular project. Um, but an important part of the ODD also is to express how things are intended to be displayed. Yeah, so with the TI processing model, we cannot just express the rules. So how, um, how were transcriptions done, what attributes were used, but thanks to processing model, we are also able to specify how should core features of these texts be rendered in print, in HTML or in other media. Um, 
So from this perspective, the odd is the central um, central connection point um, or bracket uh, keeping a project together. And we will work a lot with odds in this, this workshop. Um, advantage of the odd also is that uh, it's a bit like literal programming. It's a normal TI document, so you don't have to learn any special syntax. It's just XML, it's TI. Um, plus, you can mix documentation and um, instructions as you like. So you can use the full power of TI to document um, your ODD, which is a bit like literate programming. OK, so the important thing to understand here is that you, if you have the TI XML sources and you have an ODD, which is properly written and has processing instructions, then that will always be enough to reconstruct a meaningful representation of a text, at least concerning the, the key features of, of the text. Yeah, like um, what are the highlights? Um, how should uh, notes be displayed? Yeah. So in, in, re in real projects, you often have a complex um, a complex mix of nodes which are displayed differently. Um, how are uh, how is semantic information to be displayed and all this stuff? All this can be expressed in the ODD with the help of processing instructions. So the key here is actually to achieve sustainability. If I have TI XML and I have a properly written art, then I can somewhat guarantee that even in 20, 30 years, when I may not even be alive anymore, someone can take this, look at it, and somehow understand what I did and reproduce it. That's, that's the goal. Because only then we can really make sure that um, the results of our work are sustainable long-term. OK, so let's get into the processing model itself. So let's say we have a TI source. And this uh, TI source, well, you know the basic structure. Yeah, it has a TI root element, usually. It has a TI header. But then um, the, the text part will usually start with text, and in there is a body. And then say this document consists of um, a bunch of TI fragments. Um, what we choose as a fragment depends on the type of document and how we want to show it to the user. But in the simplest case, let's say we just have a sequence of TI divisions. So, and we want to show those divisions page by page. So if the user sees the document the first time, then we display the first division corresponding in this case to a chapter, say. And if user navigates to the next page, then we show the second division. Now what the TI processing model allows us to do is to pass those um, divisions to the ODD and format um, the elements appearing in this fragment. So basically, the ODD is a series of specifications. They are all called element spec, yeah, so for element specification. And each element spec knows how to deal with a certain element. Yeah, so the, the first one knows about divisions. The second one knows about headings. The third one knows about um, lists. So if our fragment is passed to the ODD for processing, then um, the processing model engine, in this case TI Publisher, would see, OK, there's a division, so I need to 
uh, process it with this rule. And then I continue below and I find a head. Okay, the head, this would be called, handled by this rule. And um, the list would be handled by the, the third rule. That's how it basically works. So it's a lot like um, XSLT for those of you who know it, um, but certainly more restrictive. Um, so you do all your decisions based on um, the name of the element you are processing. Inside an element spec, you can also distinguish between um, different cases, like here we want to treat um, a division of type chapter different than a division of, say, type um, or um, uh, subsection. So this can, oops, this can also be done within an element spec. Um, what's also important to note is that the element specs, they map elements to something called a behavior. What's a behavior? A behavior is an abstract concept, um, like a paragraph or a heading or a footnote. You know? So the basic idea is because the, the ODD essentially should be media independent. So it should not play a role if I'm going to generate HTML or if I want to generate a PDF. The idea is that in both cases, you have certain abstract elements and they, they are essentially the same. If it's a paragraph in HTML or if it's a paragraph in the PDF, doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so in principle, um, if you are writing an ODD, then you do not pay that much attention to um, am I creating HTML or do I create a tech output or do I create FO or EPUB? Basically, you want as much as possible to just stay the same, no matter how it is output. And then you only customize certain rules which differ. Like for sure in HTML, you can do things which you can't do in a book. Um, so you will need special rules for that. But the basic stuff like headings, paragraphs, and so on will stay the same. That's, that's the idea behind it. So what could be behaviors? Um, behaviors defined in the specification, or we already had it like a heading. Yeah, so this would be uh, a heading. Then we have paragraphs, that's the easiest. We have footnotes. Um, we have something which is called an alternate. So an alternate uh, switches between two states. Um, on the web, this can be realized using pop-ups. So like if I mouse over Paulus here, then um, I will get, get an explanation of the, who Paulus was. Um, in print, this will obviously look different because we don't have pop-ups in books, unfortunately. So likely it will uh, be rendered as a footnote and so on. But the basic concept is we have an alternate, so we switch between two conditions, like um, yeah, what is displayed in the text and some other condition which is triggered by a user action. Um, okay, in a book, the user action would be to look up the footnote. Uh, on, in the web, it would be to mouse over something or click on it or stuff like this. Um, yeah, other behaviors uh, which are frequently used are like breaks. So the page breaks here um, are formatted as breaks. And more generic, we also have inline things like this highlighted place name here is um, an inline behavior. And we have blocks, which are, <clears throat> which are a bit more generic than paragraphs. Uh, in this case, just used for the opener. So essentially what we are, what we are doing in TI Publisher is we map um, TI elements to those abstract behaviors 
and customize them. That's the basic principle. Okay, so let's actually get started uh, with the hands-on part before we look at an actual element spec. I would like to switch to my web browser again. So going to our playground with the documents. If I click on any of those documents, they will already be rendered through an ODD. Um, the ODD being used is like the standard ODD published by the, the TI consortium. Um, it contains uh, default rules for like the most common I don't know how many, several hundred um, TI elements. There's a lot it does not cover. Like if we look at this document, then um, if we look at the document source, then we know that uh, there are some elements in it. Like this here, I think is marked up in TI as an emphasis. Um, we have people appearing here, which do also not like Botschaftsrat Schirlich. Um, I know that it is marked up in the TI, but it does not appear here. So we cannot see that this is a, a person. It has no special formatting. So a lot of stuff is already um, defined by default. And this is why we actually get a rather um, okay-ish representation of the text here. Um, and we can now start to customize it. Um, customizing means that we take this default and we extend it with more specific rules to cover things like, yeah, this emphasis here or um, the names of those people. So going back to the start page, I need to explain a bit more. What you see to the right here is a collection of already existing ODD files um, used by TI Publisher for the various examples. Most of those would not work um, with our documents because each ODD targets a very specific use case and a specific type of TI. I mean, what we can do is just go here to one of the texts and try to apply another ODD. So to do this, click on the um, this, how is it called icon? Um, don't know the one with the three lines. And what, op what opens is a sidebar and here you can actually change the ODD being applied to this document. So I can cha change it to something else. Like you see by default, it uses TI publisher base. What happens if I switch to Shakespeare place? Yeah, well, it looks a bit more messed up. I could also try to uh, use anything else like Deutsches Text Archiv. Okay, not much different, also looks messed up. I could switch just for fun to docbook and then everything is gone because as the name says, this ODD was not made for TI at all. It addresses docbook uh, in which our documentation is written. So, but where we start is um, always TI publisher base. That's the default. That's what will be used when you have no other ODD specified. Okay, so now we want to start customizing this. The first thing we would need to do is go to start and create an ODD of our own. Um, I would ask everyone working on the server to use um, 
your own uh, name, like I will just do Wolfgang, and then say, um, well, in this case, it's the DOTIS document we are working on. So I call my ODD now Wolfgang slash DOTIS. Um, this name should not contain spaces. Yeah, so please use a, a dash. And then I need some title, so I will just call it Wolfgang Dodis. Um, next, I click on Create. And this will now generate an ODD just for, for me. And if you are working on the server, please follow the same procedure. Use your name um, and then dash uh, or hyphen. Uh, do this so you have an odd just for yourself with which no one else interferes. So I created this ODD and I now go back to the playground and again select one of the documents. Uh, this is still using, again, I go to the sidebar, this is still using TI Publisher base ODD as you can see, but I would now like to switch to my just created own ODD. So I go to Wolfgang Dodis. Funny enough, nothing has changed. It still looks exactly the same as before. Um, okay, but obviously I have not customized anything yet. So by default, my ODD will just be empty, but it will inherit from the default base ODD. Yeah, so ODDs basically um, can, they, they can inherit things from their parents and those parents, they inherit from their parents and so on. That's the, the basic idea. So I'm starting with a completely empty ODD, but it does inherit everything from its parent, which is the base ODD. Okay, so now, if I want to start customizing things, there are two ways to do it. Um, as I said, basically, the ODD is just an XML document. Um, but not everyone likes to work directly in XML. So what TI Publisher offers is a form-based um, editor. Uh, to make it easier for you to work with the TI processing model. So if I'm in this document and I have my um, ODD selected, which I can always confirm by looking at the URL and it says ODD equals Wolfgang Dodis or odd. That's what I want. Um, so if this is the case, then I can go to admin and I can click on edit ODD. If I click on it, then I get into this uh, screen, which at the moment is still empty except for some metadata I entered. Yeah, and I could enter more here. Um, but otherwise, there's nothing in here yet because we have not customized anything yet. This form-based view is just one possibility. Another possibility would be to actually work on the XML of the ODD. So the ODD is an XML document. If I want to switch between the two approaches, then I can click on ODD source. And what opens up is um, exists um, browser-based editor Advantage is that everyone will have this. Um, so it will work exactly the same like you. And this shows me the TI of my ODD. So as I said, an ODD document is just um, TI, an ordinary TI document. As you can see, it starts with TI, it has a TI header, um, it has a body. In there, you will always see the schema spec as the root element. And in there, it's empty um, because we have not started customizing yet. So what we 
will do now is to start writing our own rules into this ODD. Okay, so I need to switch back to my presentation for a moment. Okay, so let's start with how the XML view of an ODD would look like. Um, it's actually quite straightforward because the whole processing model, I think it just has like three or four um, elements you need to learn, um, plus uh, about uh, 2,000 behaviors you would need to learn or look up and a handful or so of attributes you need to know. So there's not really that much for you to learn in terms of additional TI elements. Basically, if we want to, um, to process a given TI element, what we need is an element spec. So this element spec, it has an identifier which corresponds to the element we want to process. In this case, in this example, we want to process a, a name. Yeah, so um, there are different ways to encode names in TI. One is to use name, another one is to use purse name. Um, there are even more like RS and so on. Um, in this case, this document was using name. So that's the name of the element to be processed by this element specification. Then we have a model uh, which references a behavior. Yeah, so name is something in the middle of the text. Uh, so the behavior is obviously inline. Yeah, it's inline text. So we tell uh, the I publisher via the processing model that the name element should be um, processed via it, the inline behavior. And we can also further customize it. Like if we want this name to appear in color, we can add this output rendition element, which takes uh, styling instructions. The styling instructions are CSS. So, uh, CSS is the, the styling language of the web. Um, you don't need to be a CSS expert for using a TI processing model or TI publisher because you actually want to limit the styling here to the, to the minimum. Um, so you don't need to learn a lot of CSS. We will talk about this in a, in a second. So this is the XML view if you prefer to work with with xml and angle brackets that's then that's that's the way you do it but as i said ti publisher provides this form based interface which makes things easier in particular if your odd becomes larger so if you have like say 50 different rules in your odd then um searching for a given given rule with uh yeah find and then ident equals name um, takes time. The form-based editor makes this simpler. So in the form-based editor, the very same rule will look like this. Ah, mouse. So what you have to the left is all the element specs, which are already defined in the odd. Then you can click on one. It, it will open up. Um, up here, you will see the name of the element, which is processed by this element spec. The behavior is selected here. And the styling instructions, so-called output renditions, they go in here. So it's essentially the same, just a different representation, a different workflow. So let's actually do something. Uh, practical and do our first elements back. So going back to the browser.
So I will first use the um, form-based editor, and then we can look afterwards into the actual XML. So if I go back to my document, uh, which I still have here, then as I already said, certain things in this document are encoded in TI, but they are not shown. And we want to extend the ODD to show us those elements. Uh, to look at the source code of the document, if you don't have, have it in another editor's window somewhere, um, you can also just click on download and say um, download XML. So this will again open up will open up uh, this Excite window and show you the document. If you browse through the document, um, you will find that it has a lot of metadata on top. And then the actual text is rather short. But looking at it, uh, yeah, you will see that we have those purse names, which do not appear in the output yet. Um, where's this emphasized text? Uh, confused. Let's look here. Oh, yeah, we have this deposit all the environments. Oh no, here it's not marked up, so I want I wanted to target a different document. Let me go back to the playground. Uh, is it this one? Yeah. So here we should have this gemeinsame Erklärung aller Fraktion der Volkskammer, which actually should appear in, in italics or something. So I will look at the XML again to confirm. Scrolling down to the actual text. Yeah, so here we can see that, for example, we have this emphasized uh, text fragment in line here in the first uh, second paragraph. And we would actually like to, to make this display. So we go to our ODD and we know what we want to style is this emphasis uh, element. So what I do here is I enter emph, click on the plus to add a new rule for this element. And this creates a completely empty element spec for now. So the first thing I need to do is an add an actual model to this element spec, which I can do by clicking on the plus sign here. And I say model. And then within this model, I see it has by default behavior inline, which is okay because we are actually displaying something inline here. And the only thing I want is I want to make this italic. So we said that, um, styling things should go into to those renditions. So I click on the plus here to add um, an editor below. And now all I do is say fonts, font style uh, italic. So once I'm done with this, I click on the save button. And go back to my text and now I just do reload. So sorry, uh, I have to click, not use the keyboard. I click on the reload button up here. And uh, was I in the right document? Where am I? This is not the document I had, uh, or no, it is. What why can I see it? Oh, I you haven't selected the ODD. Yes, thank you. That's it. So I switched to the wrong ODD. Um, as I said, always make sure that you're actually looking at the correct document using your ODD, which you can confirm up in the browser uh, location bar. OK. Um,
Now, we could also, instead of doing this form-based, we could also directly change the, the XML, right? Um, so we already had the ODD open here. The problem now just is that um, I cannot work in both environments at the same time. So I have to decide either I do it um, via the form, which I would recommend, or I do it directly in the XML. Um, because otherwise, uh, TI Publisher will lose sync. Yeah? So if you look at this, then it has not changed. But if we reload the document, then we will see that it has actually changed. And uh, yeah, I need to, the formatting is not proper. So let me just format it for you. Um, if you look at it, then you see that now we have this element spec in here, which corresponds to what I just had on my presentation slide. So you can see that, that both are um, actually in sync. Yeah, but you need just need to be careful where you are making edits and then you need to reload either the one or the other if you are using both. But I would recommend to really use the form-based editor because for a start, it will be easier. Um, anyway, if you still want to use the XML editor, then it's important. Well, first of all, you also need to be logged in. I'm not sure why I was thrown out. Um, Okay, so if you edit it here, say uh, we also want to add some color or we want to make the whole thing bold as well. So we do font weight bold and then just click on save. And now if we go to our document, somewhat I was thrown okay, again. If you go back to our document um, and reload, um, it's not applied. Why? Because we actually need to um, regenerate regenerate the ODD output. Um, so this can be done via this button here um, or via the editor. If you use the editor, then this step is done automatically. Yeah, so now we can see it's uh, not just italic, but also bold. Um, so important here is um, you can directly edit XML. If you edit it in XML, then please make sure that when you go back to the document, you click on this button. If you are working with the form-based approach, you don't need to do that. It's enough to just save here. Um, and please don't mix the two approaches because if I click save again, then my other changes will be lost. So um, decide which one you want to use and stick to it. That's that's the best. Okay, um, I see we are also running a bit out of time because I'm I was slower than than I thought. But um, if you are okay, then um, I would continue for another half an hour, and uh, we can also um have some some questions yeah so if anyone um needs to leave quickly then then and you still have a question then please shout now otherwise i will just continue for a bit okay so going back um to my presentation mm -hmm to switch again. So we saw this um, output rendition element into which we can write CSS. The question is, what do you write in there? Um, so this can certainly be discussed, but my approach would be, what should go into output rendition is everything um, referring to editorial aspects, um, expressing specific features of the text. Background is you don't want to mess with, with a web design 
um, with the design of your overall web page. Yeah. So what you want to express is this particular um, word should be in bold because that's what the author um, of the text want um, used, or it's what what I would like to express. Um, so that's okay, but like things like font family or font size or stuff like that is likely um, something which should not be designed via output rendition um, because you don't want to interfere with, say, your web designer. Yeah, your web designer then later will create a design for you and it uses certain font families, it uses certain margins between headings and and text bodies and so on and you don't want to mess with with um this girl or guy um so don't be over specific in your output rendition um just limit it to the things you actually want to express as an editor of the text um okay one step further um, so far, we only had one single model in our element spec. Now, there might be cases when we want to distinguish between different, um, yeah, different types of elements appearing in our text. So in this particular case, still using the name um, element example, we have two types of names. We have personal names and we have place names. And say you want to format both, um, but differently. So the place names should be in small caps, whereas um, all the um, personal names should be in some color. Um, so we can actually have multiple models and distinguish between them using a so-called predicate a predicate that's a condition. No? So this model will only apply to elements matching the condition. Uh, so matching elements type where, where type attribute equals place. In many places inside the ODD, you have to write um, XPath. Yeah? But it's very limited XPath. So you can go a long way just knowing very basic XPath. Um, so in this case, it's just, so add type is an attribute, uh, reference is an attribute and equals, well, that's, that's obvious. So the attribute type should equal place. Um, and then we have a second model which will be used whenever the first model does not apply because it does not match the condition, the predicate. Um, this means that you can have multiple models and all you have to, to remember is that whatever happens, the first model with a matching or no predicate will be applied. So what may happen by mistake is that you have uh, a model on top which has no predicate and then your second model has has a specific predicate but it will never be seen because ti publisher basically chooses the first model which matches and that's it so let's look at a concrete um example one sec i just need to uh, switch again my screen. Da, da, da. Mm, Okay, switching my screen again. Uh, where are we? So if we look at the heading here, um, yeah, it, it also looks a bit uh, strange. So it doesn't really make that much sense. And this is because actually we have two titles here. We have one 
uh, from here to here, and we have another one from here to here, which should actually be below. Yeah, so it's like two titles, and we also have this reference to um, the the system where where this text is um, is archived, and we want to show this a bit. Uh, a bit differently, like with actual two titles. Um, if we look at the XML again, we can do download XML. Um, we see this type. No, this uh, that's the header. I'm stupid. Go down to the text. Yeah. So we have this head, and it has like the first bit is obviously a ref pointing to uh, metadata about the document. The second bit is um, the main title because it has title type main. Then there's the third title, which has title type sub. So obviously, um, the editors are uh, intended to express uh, at least two different types of title here, type main and type sub. but at the moment, everything um, in our output is kind of merged into one single uh, one single title, which is not nice. So we want to change that. What do we need to do? We need another um, rule for title in this case, because that's what we want to format. So whenever you want to do something, the first job is to identify what's the element I want to operate on, and then you take it from there. So in this case, we want a rule for our title type main and one for our title type sub. So what I do is I add an element, element spec for title. Now, it's quite confusing because as you can see, a lot of models and stuff has already been added here now. Yeah, This is because um, our ancestor ODDs already define some rules for title, which makes things a bit difficult here. But just ignore it. Um, don't buffer with it. We want to add two additional rules on top. And we can just do so clicking plus here again and then on model. And our first rule should apply to what was it? Title type main. So we need to enter a predicate and we do type equals main. So that's for the for the first kind of title. And we want it to display as an actual title, so a heading. So we need to change the behavior from inline to heading. And that should already be enough to make this title appear um, as a heading. But we have this second title. We have the second title, so we need another rule for title type sub. So I go here and do another one. And in this case, the predicate expression would be type equals sub. Um, again, we want this to be a heading. So let's see what happens. I click on save. And I go to my document. I just reload the page. And voila, as you can see, um, we now have nicely formatted two uh, titles. However, uh, there's no distinction between those two types of titles. Yeah, So the main title is as uh, large as the um, subtitle which is likely not what we want. So we want this to be a bit smaller. Um, 
right? So that's not not that difficult. I mean, the simple solution would be, I just go here into, no, that's title type main, um, that's wrong. I want to go to type sub. And I make the whole text a bit smaller, let's say by doing font size, uh, I don't know what the other one is, but let's say 20 pixel. And then just save it and see if it helped. Reload. Yeah, so that, that helped. However, I actually just violated what I said before because I said mm, font size is not something you should change um, here in within the odd. Um, nevertheless, I just did it for us for this example. And I will explain in a minute um, how to do it differently and uh, properly. But we see that we now have um, two model model rules for for the title with different predicates, and we can actually distinguish between the two types of title. Okay. Um, so, and I need to quickly check again. Yeah, so. Oh, where am I here? I will just stay on the on the browser window. Okay, so I said this is this is a bad approach. Um, so I will just delete it again, and we we are going to use something else. Um, <clears throat> Because um, actually every <clears throat> heading behavior, <coughs> sorry, it is clear that that a heading. So in a document, you always have headings on different levels. Yeah, you have like um, ch chapter headings, and you have section headings and subsection headings, and they are on different levels. In HTML. You have the same, it's expressed as, well, heading level one is H1, and then there's H2 and H3 and so on. Um, so headings can be on different levels, which is why for the heading behavior, there exists a parameter which is called um, level, expressing the level um, this heading is on, which can be anything from one to I don't know what. And you can see that we can actually specify parameters here. So by default, every heading would be on level one. Um, but now let's just uh, degrade this uh, subtitle heading so it goes on level two. So we define a parameter called level. And we set its value to two. Now let's save it and see if this had an effect. Ah, I clicked keyboard again instead of using. Oh, oops, didn't work. One second, I set it on level two. What happens if I do level three? No. Well, what's the problem? Okay, level three did work. Um, not sure why, but anyway, it demonstrates the feature for now. So let me show my slides again. Yeah. 
So just to explain this, um, in the XML view, if you look at the XML, then um, a the parameters would be passed in as child elements of the, the model element, and it would just be param name mm -hmm, value equals something. Um, essentially, what kind of parameter a behavior accepts is defined in the in the spec. Um, basically, every behavior takes at least one parameter, which is called content. So on any model and behavior, you can define one parameter content, and this will always be known because content is um, points to the nodes which are processed by this behavior. And normally, that's the element itself. So if you have a heading, uh, so a head element in TI, then the content being passed to the behavior heading would be the head element, the current head element being processed. Um, so normally you don't need to specify content. We did not specify it before in the other examples. You only need to specify content if you actually want to modify what a behavior processes. And this is quite important as we will see next week because we are running out of time. Um, but there are cases when actually you want to modify the content and point the behavior, the current rule, to something else, to a fragment in the document which is located in another place, say the header or <clears throat> in the back matter or somewhere else. <clears throat> so understanding content is quite important because it, it's being used to do this kind of pulling in information from other parts of the, the document or changing the sequence in which things are being processed. However, most behaviors, or well, not most, but some behaviors also need additional parameters. So obviously, if you want to output um, a link to an external website or anything else, then um, it's always a, um, a sequence of text, but you also need to have something uh, to point to, something this link should lead to, so a URI, which is why the link behavior needs at least one additional parameter, which is called URI and contains the URI. Likewise, alternate, as we said, is a behavior which switches between two states. So it takes two parameters called default and alternate. You can look up um, what parameters, oh no, you can't see it. Uh, I need to change the... to switch again. So in the TI Publisher documentation, you find a list of available behaviors. Yeah, so we just had alternate, um, which takes two parameters in TI Publisher, even an optional third. Um, so this is the list of available um, behaviors you can use in your um, models. And as you can see, link does have this URI parameter. Um, heading does have a level parameter. So you can look up those things here in this list. OK, so I think we should uh, use the remaining 10 minutes for questions, maybe. So if you have a question, um, yeah, I think it's okay to just uh, talk. So also switch off your switch on your microphone.
Um, uh, I would have a question um, concerning the ODDs and saving them um, to give them to someone else. Is mm -hmm. that a possibility? And how would I go about doing that? Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. So you can um, save the ODD. Let me share the correct window again. Okay, so I'm I'm in the in the graphical editor, but um, I already showed you that you. Okay, well, it looks like we are having problems with the sound. Can anyone hear me? Yes, I, can I think hear. it's I frozen. Think we, we I lost think Wolfgang's Wolfgang. connection is, is dead. It's lost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm back. Can you hear me again? Okay, yes. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> okay, sorry, so I will just start again uh, because I don't know where you lost me. <laughs> um, in the very beginning. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, changing to the XML um, view, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So you change to the XML view, and then you see the uh, the ODD as it currently is, um, and then I can do file download, and this will. Uh, so my browser will download a copy of this file to my local disk, and then I can just uh, use it, so open okay. it. Okay. Yeah, and basically, if I pass this ODD to a colleague, say, yep. then this person could just upload it into her or his TI publisher Yeah, using this upload panel, just drag and drop it there, and then apply it to uh, his or her own documents. Would it be also um, possible to save it um, in a Git repository and tell the TI publisher that he should access it directly from Git? Or should you um, set it from your own disk space, basically? Um, no, I mean, when you are uh, working on actual projects, then you would want to put those things into into a git repository so you um, have tracking and you don't lose anything yeah um, however for this you would probably set up your own project so that's that's something we actually will have a look at during the third week i guess okay you know? um, so because then you can generate your own project out of ti publisher which you would then put into into git altogether so not just the odd but also um, some other files which are needed for ti publisher to work properly and then you can always pass this to colleagues and they will be able to rebuild um, your state of things okay wonderful thank you yeah but did i understand correctly that the other part of the question was can you point yeah, I publish it directly to the Git repository to kind of pull dynamically the ODD from there. As I understood it, that is possible, but it doesn't um, require only the ODD. So um, the dependencies wouldn't be um, fulfilled if you just only put the ODD on Git. So you have to create a project that contains all of it. So that, um, yeah, we have to be instructed on how to do it properly, but just the ODD can be shared um, with a colleague. 
did I get that right? Um, yes, yes, that's right. So you can just share the the ODD with someone. Um, otherwise, yeah, you would probably set up your own Git workflow or yeah, so way way you work with Git. It depends a bit on what approach you use. There are multiple possible approaches. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but certainly for a real world project, I would definitely uh, at some point push everything into a Git yeah. repo quite early on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we are in the process of doing that, but uh, as we are just setting it up we didn't know how to do that properly so in two mm -hmm. weeks time i guess we will know how to do it properly okay thank you so are there other questions I think a bit earlier in the chat we had uh, yeah a bit of side discussion about the motivation again for for using the processing models and uh, and ODD. So I don't know if it's a good good moment to revisit that. I think also. <laughs> I don't know if she's still with us. Mm, seems the sound is lost. I, I also missed this discussion in the chat. Uh, yeah, so I don't know where the discussion is, but certainly, <clears throat> well, it's, uh, we, we can continue uh, discussing things on, on Slack. And so the, the, the question was, why do you need the ODD? Doesn't the TI already tell the abstract concepts? And uh, I think James has been answering, so maybe he would like to repeat uh, his answer, so I don't have to retell his words. I, I thought you answered better than I did. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's mostly because the TEI doesn't focus on presentation. It, it it focuses on very abstract concepts like you know divisions and titles in a very general uh, way. Yeah, I, I, exactly. So that that's how it, I will also say that. While TI represents the, the, the source, the, the document, the processing model is concerned about transformation into, into the output. Yeah? And we call it this abstract, uh, we call behaviors as abstract uh, concepts because um, they represent certain ideas. If you imagine talking to your web, web designer or your developer, uh, whom you would hire um, to do these things for you, you quite often find yourself saying, oh, and I want, say, the apparatus entry to be realized as a footnote, yeah? Or I want this to be a marginal note, or I want this to be an inline portion of text formatted somehow, yeah? And then you are not necessarily concerned how it is really implemented, how it is realized, because in print it would be realized slightly differently than on the web. Yeah, so th this is the idea of, of behavior, this abstract concept that we are using to communicate certain intentions. So for example, with the alternate one, wanting that apparatus entry to be a tool tip on the web, but in PDF, a footnote. Obviously until we get books with pop-up thingies. Okay, so now I also found the, <laughs> the conversation. I, I was looking at Slack and not into the comments on Jitsi. 
Mm. Are there other questions? I would like to ask um, about ODDs. Um, let's say that you have different, sorry, different types of uh, texts, for instance, plays, letters, poems, and um, I would like to know if you would create one ODD for all of them or three different ODDs for each kind of text. Good question. Um, uh, I think it depends on uh, how and why you're constraining those. What most people do is is use, as uh, and I know you know, um, but for others, uh, use ODD to constrain the very general TI framework into a very specific schema for just their project. Now, if you find lots of common events of um, uh, or common occurrences of of you know uh, the way you style names in a poem versus a letter versus a uh, I could forget what the other things were you said said then uh, doing that all in one ODD sort of makes sense but if these are very uh, different types of documents you might style them very differently and have different outputs so have different ODDs. Yeah, and from from the processing model perspective, yeah, so kind of putting this question, so how did you arrive uh, uh, at your at your schema? But purely for processing model, you you maybe uh, noticed that when Wolfgang created his customized ODD, uh, it has been customization or extension uh, of TI publishers ODD. So there's this concept of linking, linking ODDs. And so your ODD is supposed to be changing only the the parts of the uh, of the TI simple print recommendation, only in the parts that that differ. So in your own project, you might want to do it like that. For example, to have one most general. ODD, but say where poems differ a lot, you might want to have a specification separately for poems, but that is linked to your more generic, so it will only change the two, three, five things that uh, that poems require. So that would be one uh, approach. Alternative would be to use uh, to passing certain parameters or 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 maybe using attribute values to distinguish distinguish different uh, use case scenarios like Wolfgang Illustrated with names, type, person, names, type, place. So it kind of depends. That's the short answer. Thank you. OK, sorry for the frozen screen, but <laughs> my desktop computer crashed, so I now switch to the laptop. Um, but anyway, are there further questions? I, I, I've sort of got a question, which is, when you have a behavior that has a required parameter, I was sort of surprised to see the odd editor, uh, the, the visual odd editor, not sort of automatically uh, turn on that parameter or require that parameter. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's 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 true. Actually, it could be extended, um, yeah, to somewhat uh, automatically fill in that that parameter. Um, the implementation actually tries to yeah to be fail safe. So whenever a required parameter is not provided, it will try to figure out some fallback. Um, okay, obviously for some things this this will not work. Like if, if there's a link without a parameter, okay, then in HTML it will just be a link to the same page. But um, yeah, you will notice that it doesn't work. Um, so, but nothing bad is going to happen. Okay.
Yeah, there may be a few, few words how we expect to the things to follow for the week. Yep, OK. Um, unfortunately, my screen is frozen, so I try to share it again from my laptop. Mm -hmm. So um, now you should see my screen again. Yes. Um, so we did not get as as far as I intended, but I think that's not not a surprise because I had packed quite a lot into this first session, um, and I was in the end uh, slower than I thought. But it's okay because this means that we. Yeah, I have, have some more stuff for, for next week to catch up with. Um, and it's maybe also good to progress a bit slower because I understand there are lots of um, people <clears throat> in this group who have uh, only little experience with <clears throat> things like XPath and CSS and stuff like this. So if you look at, the, <clears throat> at this assignments, <clears throat> document um, basically what we did today was like make emphasis <clears throat> to display in italic um, we were doing the formatting of the, the main heading so that would be 2.1 <clears throat> and we somewhat handled uh, passing parameters to behaviors um, <clears throat> so i think it would be good if everyone could work through those examples again, and then maybe try if you can solve <clears throat> the follow-up um, assignments in each of the, the sections. Um, like, I mean, render first name in color. <clears throat> should should uh, be fairly straightforward. You would just need to look up the CSS for, for changing color of text. And in each assignment, I always provided a screenshot showing how I would expect the output to look like. Um, for sure, you are free to use any color here. I chose orange because it's my favorite color, but you can also do it in blue or whatnot. Um, so the screenshot always shows how on my machine I did realize um, the assigned task. Um, then the next one would be move the date line to the right. At the moment, it's to the left. If you look at the document, and I would like to, uh, I would like to see it on the right. Using predicates, yeah, the first one we already did together, um, and then two dot two, yeah, is also not. That difficult. Yeah, and then just try um, try those assignments up to uh, topic number four because we have not dealt with with that yet. Yeah, so one, two, and four uh, and three. Those are the sections you should be able to solve with um, what you heard um, today. Um, yeah, I think it will be good to just, once we have the video on YouTube, um, to just review the corresponding bits and pieces. I mean, you don't need to listen to everything again, but just those bits where um, I explain certain features or do something online. Um, yeah, as I said, you can either use the, the server or you can, um, use your locally installed um, TI publisher. Yeah, and then for questions, uh, just use the Slack room, ideally. Uh, we will monitor what's going on there and try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, that a lot of um, 
people uh, contribute and we have a lively discussion there. Any questions concerning this? No, I hope I'm still. Yeah, you can be heard, but it looks like people are mostly saying thank you in the chat. Thank you, Wolfgang. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. People leave now, I think. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I did not have the right window open. Okay, yes, then thank you very much, guys, and see you next Monday, same time.